Okay, um, so much to unpack um, and here to help us to do just that is our first plenary panel of the day. It will be moderated by a very good friend of ours, Elizabeth Molovidov. Um, Dr. Molovidov is a mom to two tech savvy little boys, a lawyer, a law professor, and an e-safety consultant. Her core work involves researching solutions for parenting in the digital age. And she has authored several guides and workbooks for parents. She moderates a Facebook community uh, for parents and is the founder of digitalparentingcoach.com a website and community with resources for parents. And joining us all the way from Paris, I'm pleased to welcome Elizabeth, who will lead us in a discussion about the research that we've just heard. Elizabeth? Yes, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is so exciting. Thank you, Stephen. I um, just absolutely love uh, Fozy, so I'm really happy to be here with this fabulous, fabulous panel uh, that I'm going to let each one of you introduce yourselves just two to three minutes, and then we're going to jump right in and really dig through some of um, Molly's research. So I'm going to start with you, Ethan, uh, because you're the first one on my screen to my right. So please, could you introduce yourself? Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Ethan Aronson. I am the head of digital safety at Verizon. Uh, that job basically means three things. I take a look at content standards across the company. I lead our fight against child exploitation and making sure that child exploitation materials do not make it onto our platform. And I work with our product teams to make sure that we're incorporating child safety by design when we are building products. Nothing else that you want to add? You're good? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Great fabulous. Start. <laughs> Great start. Okay, Alexa. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today and Elizabeth for moderating this session. I'm honored and delighted to be joined by Molly and Ethan. By way of introduction, I'm a research associate on the youth and media team at the Brookman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. The youth and media team encompasses a variety of research, advocacy, and development initiatives around young people ages 12 to 18 and digital technologies. And I'm very excited to share some of my insights today around FOSI's fantastic research. Well, that's great. I think we're more excited to have your insights, but thank you. Um, Molly, you've already been introduced, but is there anything that you would like to add that was missed out earlier? Um, I would just add that I've been working with kids and families uh, for over 20 years in the research that I've been doing at MAGID. Um, I'm focused on the qualitative side of things. Uh, and I just have, I feel like it's it's such a great place to be researching because it's constantly changing. And uh, it's fascinating to see how the confluence of, of media and technology has impacted families. And I would say largely, I would argue largely for the positive. And uh, it's great that we get a chance to get in here and explore what we can do to help support uh, kids and families as things cool. continue to evolve. Fabulous. I think so too. As somebody who speaks with a lot of parents around the world, uh, I know that they are just waiting for this type of research and trying to figure out how they can have some actionable parent friendly steps to really, you know, take care of their digital families. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you a question and, you know, you can just jump in and answer whatever just feels like it's yours, okay? So what was your first reaction um, to the findings? Um, what was something that stood out to you particularly? Um, let's see, I'm gonna go with Alexa first, just because Molly, you were just the last panel. I'll come to you, I promise. Alexa? Great. What was most interesting and encouraging to me was that one, on the whole, parents are uh, proactive and engaged in helping their children navigate the risks the digital world may present. Nearly all parents report having conversations with their children about online safety concerns. And two, as Molly noted in the previous session, the majority of parents overall, about 76%, feel that these conversations are successful. And these insights made me think, what exactly did these conversations look like beyond the specific topics brought up, whether that was gaming or social media use, how did parents frame the conversation with their child? 
the report mentions that different factors may prompt parents to discuss these topics with their child, like conversations with family and friends or incidents heard on the news. But how did parents actually initiate a dialogue around the topic? And central to parents helping their child safely navigate the digital world is that they engage positively when it comes to both online and offline concerns. Absolutely. And I love hearing all of that positive engagement because there are so many positive opportunities out there. Um, so thank you so much. Now, Ethan, I'm going to come to you because I would love to know the industry uh, viewpoint here. What was your first reaction? So I thought the research was fascinating and a couple areas really stood out to me. Um, and, you know, Molly really got into this, but the generational differences to me are really the headline here. The differences between boomer and millennial parents and how they're raising their kids uh, were surprising to me. And there are giant differences there. Uh, I think this is a reflection of the fact that younger parents are, you know, grew up as digital natives. They were really the first generation to have social media from childhood on. And I think that is translated to a higher expectation uh, for industry. Millennial parents want to see industry doing more. They view this as a partnership. Whereas boomer parents are kind of of that mentality that this is a parent problem and that parents are going to solve it. Um, the other really interesting generational difference for me was the, the kind of risk assessment difference. So I think boomer parents are still in this kind of stranger danger, you know, this Hollywood villain kind of mentality where mm -hmm. my kids are most at risk from a stranger that we've never met before, someone that's going to appear one day out of nowhere. Whereas millennial parents recognize that a lot of the risks are with people that you know, with kids from school or with others that kids know from the family or close cousins or whatever. Um, millennial parents, I think, also recognize that their own kids can be the problem. Millennial parents have pointed out they're worried about their own kids misbehaving on social media or their own kids being bullies. Mm -hmm. And that's really a fascinating insight that I think, again, is really educated by the fact that they grew up on these networks, on social networks, and realize the dangers uh, both, you know, receiving and giving. Um, and then the other point that stood out for me is this journey to trust, I think, as, as Molly has called it. It's this, this focus on 7 to 11, where parents are just really laser focused on child safety. But as kids kind of age out into 12, 13 and older, parents kind of take their foot off the throttle a little bit and start to trust their kids more. And I think that makes a lot of sense in, in a lot of ways, but I also wonder if there's a, a correct risk assessment going on there. You know, if you look at the research, the number one concern, the most identified concern from all parents across age ranges is sexually suggestive content in gaming. I don't know that would have made my top 10 list, to be honest. <laughs> um, and, you know, right behind that is sexually suggestive content in books and movies. Um, and, you know, I, again, I think that can reflect this generational difference. I think that's a very boomer view of the world that the biggest concern I have is my kid being exposed to a, a program on TV late at night. Whereas I think millennial parents understand that there are a whole different set of risks that come with being online and being on social media, bullying. We've seen a huge spike in self-harm among this generation that has been exposed to social media. So those are the kind of concerns that I think millennial parents are focused on. And I think the research has really brought that out very well. Well, I think that's a, a great summary. And as a Generation X uh, parent, <laughs> I would Fighter concur. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> I would definitely concur. And interestingly enough, most of the, the parents in my parenting group are uh, boomer uh, parents and they are concerned. And I think that you're spot on uh, with, with your conclusions there. So Molly, I'm going to jump over to you now. Please, do you have anything that you would like to add? Sure. Well, I know I've been sort of beating the drum for teens throughout the whole presentation. And I just, um, I, and, and perhaps it's coming from the research we've done over the years, I feel like a, adults often, and, and in industry from a business standpoint, kids are often underestimated. Their ability to understand what's going on, their ability to grasp new concepts, um, their ability to, to navigate situations and figure out maybe what's best for them or what's best just to do in general. Uh, and so it was really heartening for me to, to have an opportunity to, to share this sort of teen insight and say, okay, these teens are really, they, they're aware. Now, are they always making the right decisions? No. 
clearly not. And we wouldn't expect them to, but the fact that they are aware of what's going on, aware of what the options are, aware of what the threats are, um, and the fact that they want to take responsibility, I think is very, uh, it's a very positive thing for all of us and, and, and for their parents as well. And I think what, just like with any, any point, whether it's, you know, learning how to drive a car or preparing for college, the more that we as an industry, we as parents um, can help empower them to make those right decisions and take responsibility in a, in the right kind of way. Um, it just, it sort of furthered that point for me. And I just, I, I can't emphasize enough how important I think that is and, and impressive it is that kids want to, that these teens kind of want to take, take it on. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they they're they're being empowered, and that's the whole name mm -hmm. of the game. Um, so you know, I'm gonna see if I can't do a quick poll here. I, I hope that somebody on the tech team will give me a thumbs up if I can. Um, can I? Because I don't see anything on my chat screen. Can I? Can I please? Somebody, let me know. Okay. Well, for the moment, I don't know, but I'm going to uh, come back in just a second because I really would like to get some of the audience's feedback uh, on this uh, uh, responsibility question. But I'm going to take a, a second and go over to um, something else that I was just thinking about as we were talking um, about the different um, lessons, especially for you, Ethan, you had mentioned, um, you know, what you're seeing with boomers, Generation X, how does this um, translate really for, for industry as far as, you know, what kind of tools, um, how they're going to be viewed, perhaps not by the different, you know, boomer Generation X, but how does this translate for you? So for me, the clear takeaway was that industry needs to be aware that this upcoming generation is expecting more that the days of releasing products without thinking about the child safety implications are over and that this millennial generation expects a partnership with industry and that you need to be thinking about how you're going to serve that generation because that is going to be the next generation of parents boomers are aging out of parenting and <laughs> companies need to adapt Don't and, say it you know, that way it's, I'm you know close. it's it's i'm it's getting close sad. As a Gen X parent, I'm right there with you, Elizabeth. But <laughs> okay, it's, we've got to acknowledge the truth, which is that you know we are we are going to to have a whole new generation of parents. That um, sounds more and, positive. I like that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's my positive spin. <laughs> uh, and you know, I think uh, to to get back to this education point, which I think is so important, I think it's fantastic that parents are and millennial parents especially are aware of the risks and the benefits that come with the internet, especially for their kids and having this kind of nonstop connectivity. Uh, they realize that there are concerns here and that they need to be cognizant of, of what their kids are viewing and how their kids are interacting. But I think it is incumbent upon industry to do that education, to, to help parents assess risk, to help parents decide you know, where are the, the risks that they need to be aware of on an individual platform an individual app, or even in the case of Verizon with just a, a cell phone in general. Parents, I think, need help assessing risk. And I think that's something that industry, together with experts like those on this panel, can help do. Okay, well, that was great because in between, uh, I was able to see that in fact, my poll did go out. So as you were talking about um, some of the responsibility, we have answers. So the question went out to the uh, members, uh, people who are listening to us right now, who has the most responsibility when it comes to keeping kids safe online? Uh, and they were given three choices, parents, industry, and government. Um, and what do you think they, they said? I'll let you guess. What do you think, Ethan? What do you think? I'm gonna guess industry given this group, but I'm- yeah, No, mm -mm. <laughs> Alexa. Good. Yes, parents. Yay, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> okay, so it's parents at 57%, then industry at 38%. So that's pretty good news for you, Ethan. And government at 5%. Um, so I do, I find that very, very interesting because I have to admit, um, Ethan, I, I would have been with you. I would have thought a little bit for industry. But Alexa, when you hear something like that, when you hear these types of uh, polls and, and results, how does the, the results of that quick poll and the results of this uh, actual work, piece of uh, fantastic work by Molly and her team, how do these results compare to other studies that you have seen uh, or that you've uh, done in your own work? Just over a year ago, 
a Pew Research study looked at how parents feel about and manage their teens' online behavior, where a thousand parents of youth ages 13 to 17 in the United States were surveyed. And many of the findings echo the results from the FOSI study in terms of one, the types of experiences teens might encounter online, two, differences in terms of parental monitoring as a function of the child's age, and three, parents' confidence in their ability to guide their teen in making good decisions online. For instance, with respect to specific online risks, parents share many of the same concerns as found in the FOSI report, such as cyberbullying, sexually suggestive content, and spending too much time in front of a screen. In terms of parental monitoring, in the FOSI study, parents of youth ages seven to 11 generally are more likely to, to monitor their children's online activities compared to parents of those ages 12 to 17. And, and somewhat comparable results are found in the Pew study. We found that parents of teens ages 13 and 14 were significantly more likely than parents of older teens to monitor their children's digital activities or enforce screen time restrictions. And finally, like the FOSI study, Pew's findings demonstrated that generally uh, parents feel good about their conversations with their children on online safety, as we learned previously. About nine in 10 parents say they are confident in their ability to teach their children about appropriate online behavior and to keep up with what their teen does or experiences online. And in terms of the youth perspective, as in the FOSI focus groups, a teen surveyed by Pew support the effectiveness of parental conversations. In the context of cyberbullying specifically, a majority of teens felt that parents were doing a good or excellent job of addressing this issue. Yeah, and I think it's just such a, a slam dunk, Molly, for you to have, you know, mm -hmm. such <laughs> a, a backup by Pew. I just love them. I love all of their research. Uh, I use it in my own work. Um, and I think it's really interesting that Alexa mentioned this, um, again, this 7 to 11 years old um, age group, because I find it fascinating. I have one child right up there and another that's in the teen. Um, and so we've learned about parents' concern uh, for online safety that it peaks, right, at this at this time. And so Molly, my, my question to you is that based on your experience in the focus groups, you know, what is typically happening during that time for families? And this might, you know, give me some insight for my own family as well. So it's a great question. And, and I also I also have a, a tween and a teen, so I feel you. Uh, <laughs> Um, so my answer to what is happening is what isn't happening in this age group. So this is the time where kids are fully engaged in school. Uh, their horizons and their influences are broadening. They start to watch edgier content. It's a for some it's a like a slippery slope or a slow climb up the maturity hill, depending on if they have older <laughs> siblings or not. Uh, and kind of like who's thrown their hands up in the house and who hasn't. Uh, and then also they're learning how to navigate technology and content often, and not to be stereotypical, but often more efficiently than their parents to some degree at least. <laughs> um, and they're exposed to so much more, their, the, their boundaries are being pushed, they're pushing their own boundaries. Uh, social media starts to come into play on the older end of that spectrum. YouTube starts very early. Uh, gaming becomes more prevalent and gaming with friends, you know, so on online, becomes more prevalent. Um, and I think even just in the last nine months, we have seen a huge <laughs> increase in the gaming industry of how many kids are playing online and how that's become an important part of the social fabric for many kids just in this immediate, this was even, you know, in, in this immediate moment. Right. Um, so all of these sources uh, where parents have less expertise and less control uh, over the moment to moment of what kids are seeing and what they're doing and where they're engaged in, I think that's where the anxiety comes from. It's there's so much coming at them and coming in. Kids are constantly trying and seeing new things, which is very normal for kids. And kids have been doing this forever, but now they just have more ways in which to execute on it. So 
in addition, I think that parents see teendom right on the horizon and that can also add to the panic. So they're like, okay, I need to get this right now. Right. So by the time they reach those teen years and I know I'm not gonna be able to have as much influence and impact and I should let them start to be responsible for themselves. Uh, I can feel more comfortable about that. So, so, so everything's happening. In a nutshell, <laughs> we're cramming everything in now because we know <laughs> that they're gonna be it's on Right. So it's a small window, right? Because then yeah, it's, it's like, very small. Now that I also, you know, got it, they're going to be fully on social media. They're going to be in high school. They learn how to drive. Let me get this <laughs> digital stuff right now. I completely before, agree. Yeah, before it's and out it's of my even, hands. It's, and it's even more so now with uh, with lockdown. I agree. I'm I'm gaming as well with them because you know it's the best way to kind of hang out. Good for you, mom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good for you. We're all going to play together after this. Um, so then, Ethan, if you're looking at this same, the same age group, the same uh, 70, 11, and you've heard Molly just diagnose my family and her own, um, what can industry do to help us? What are you going to tell parents uh, of that age range um, who are perhaps getting a phone or a device for the very first time or they're continuing on? What, what are you going to what are you going to do? What are you going to say? So I think this age range is such a great teachable moment for both parents and kids, right? Parents are totally overwhelmed, especially right now. They have so much going on in their lives and it is frankly difficult to reach parents. You need to pick your moments. Parents are willing to be educated about these topics, but you need to find the right time to do that. And in my mind, this age range is perfect for that. When their kids like mine are about 10 or 11 years old and the conversation about a phone starts and the conversation about a first tablet or social media account starts. That's a great teachable moment. It's a great time when I think parents take a breath and say, wow, this is really a big deal. This is going to change things. There's probably no going back from this. So let's get this right. Let's make sure that we have the right rules in place and that I understand exactly the consequences of what I'm doing here. So I think reaching parents, companies reaching out to parents and educating parents at that moment is really important. I also think it's really important for parents to, to make a deal with their kids. So when that first phone comes into the house, what are your house rules about that phone? Is that phone going to be charged in the parent's bedroom every night from now on? What are the rules about parental surveillance, for lack of a better word? Are parents going to be looking at all your text messages? <laughs> Setting those boundaries early, I think, is, is just so important because you're not going to get a second chance at that. And if that <laughs> phone starts charging in the kid's bedroom, it's not coming out at age 15 or 16. I think that much is, is certain. So Are you speaking hitting, from experience, Ethan? <laughs> I'm, I think I can, I can speak from experience here, yes. You sound a little convinced yes. on that one. My, <laughs> my kids are strong-willed, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, you've, you've got to find the right moment. And I think for industry, this age range really is the, the golden time. Kids are still somewhat flexible. Kids are still willing to, to listen mm -hmm. and learn. Parents are receptive. It's just a really great time to reach both folks and talk about what is the future going to look like in this new digital parenting relationship? Right. And, and, you know, teasing aside, Ethan, I have to admit, I think it's, it's fabulous that, you know, we can see all of these positives, um, you know, of how to go forward with our children and as parents, because even, you know, when something slips away from us, we can still take charge. We can still handle it, even with your strong willed kids. I know you can. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I think it's fabulous that, you know, industry is, is, you know, looking at this and that you did, you called it a golden age. And I love hearing that. Um, and I just think that right now with the pandemic as well, that this is a, I mean, we've just thrown parents into this sort of deep end of digital parenting. And this is a golden moment for all parents around the world. I mean, you have to kind of, uh, you know, make lemonade from lemons and to try to uh, do what we can. So I think, Alexa, my next question is coming over to you about, you know, this sort of a pandemic. Um, how important then are parental controls going to be um, when we know that parents are sometimes looking for perhaps an electronic babysitter or you know they just need a break or there's remote learning or there's the social networking we want to keep up with the family members how important now are parental controls for you during the pandemic i think it is important for parents to use parental controls with children ages seven to 11, mm -hmm. especially during the current pandemic, 
many children are spending hours each day learning online. And the research tells us that the more time children spend online, the more likely they are to encounter risks in the digital landscape, such as cyberbullying, exposure to violent or aggressive content, and unwanted contact from others. In the book, Born Digital by Boris Gasser, the principal investigator of the youth and media team and executive director of the Berkman Klein Center, and John Paul Freeth, president of the MacArthur Foundation and a speaker at today's event, the authors point out that to make the internet a safe space for children when they are young, some parents use controls such as filters to block access to specific sites. This is fine, particularly for younger children. However, as children enter their teen years, this type of monitoring can be ineffective. Teens will often find workarounds and it may backfire, eroding the trust between a parent and their child. At the same time, as Gina Rich writes in a recent post on the FOSI website, these are very difficult times, and I think flexibility is important now more than ever, especially given that the digital world also presents many opportunities for children around learning, socializing, and developing their creativity, and opportunities for parents to engage in online activities with their child, like playing games or watching videos together to create shared experiences and open up a dialogue. Fantastic. Well, I think what I'm going to do, if you guys don't mind, is I'm just going to jump in and see some of the questions that we received while you guys were, you know, expounding all these great uh, the theories and advice to help out parents. Um, so the first question um, is from Mohammed Bipari, and he says, uh, he asks, will we find more information about Generation uh, Z parents, Gen Z parents? Are we going to, are, will, Molly, will you be doing more? We will be absolutely continuing to, I mean, the Gen Z, um, the oldest Gen Z are just barely starting to be parents right now. And the Gen Z is, the oldest Gen Z is, I think are 23 or 24. So um, it will be very interesting to see how they choose to parent, how they, what, you know, as what the the third, the second, third generation now of, uh, of digital natives, uh, they will be, they have seen it all at this point, you know, they're, um, going to be a very, they're very exposed to everything that's going on right now. And so I think it'll be fascinating to see how they choose to parent. And then also the fact that they're coming of parenting age during this particular moment in time with um, what's going on in our country, across the board, what's going on globally with the pandemic and how that's impacted for all the things that Alexa was just talking about. And Ethan was just talking about this golden age that we're in. Um, they're going to be the parents of that age. Um, ultimately. So yeah. we will absolutely be keeping our fingers on the pulse. <laughs> and, and that's fantastic because that goes in with a second question also about Gen Generation uh, Z, which was asking you, Molly, uh, in the research, um, this is from Kaylin Munt, a graduate student at the American Graduate School of Paris, asking, are you grouping together parents of millennials and Gen uh, Generation Z to, you know, I suppose, to get things going, to have an idea? Are we doing, we didn't do that in this particular research. Is that what she's asking? Yeah, um, yes, yes. But we we were talking with, I, I believe that mo the majority of the parents that we spoke with were millennials and older. Um, because like I said, those those Gen Z parents, I know they're, they're critical and we're all sort of waiting with bated breath to see <laughs> how they're going to evolve as parents. But they right now, for the most part, are, are very young parents, if parents yes. at all. Give them time, um, give them time. Give them time, <laughs> give them a minute. But um, I think it's a great question. I love that we're already thinking about what is that next step? What's that? That next generation of parents going to be like we, um, especially given all the you know the the differences we see now between the the existing sort of more established parenting generations. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think um, I have another question here. Uh, this one is going. I'm going to throw this to you, Ethan. Uh, it is from Joe Laramie, and he asks, "Do you see a difference in perspective from parental controls and monitoring software?" So I think monitoring software is a, is a subset of parental controls. I think that the key here is to give parents choice because, and I think the research really backs this up, parents don't have one monolithic view of the right way to parent their children or even to, to keep an eye on their digital activity. 
So I think the key is to give parents choices and monitoring is one option. You know, the kind of, you know, very invasive kind of look at every text message, look at every website visited. I think that's one option and that's an option that a lot of parents choose, but it's not the only option. You know, you can, you can kind of get up to a 30,000 foot view very easily and try to, to keep an eye on perhaps text message contacts, for example, not every the text of the text message, but who were they corresponding with? So I think parental controls, the key to any successful parental control is to give parents options and let them pick and choose the safety features that they want. It shouldn't be a one size fits all solution. Okay, and Alexa, you look like you wanted to say something there, you wanted to add on. Am I reading you right? <laughs> Just to, to echo uh, Ethan's comments, I, I completely agree about uh, that it shouldn't be really a one size fits all solution. You know. Uh, I think it's increasingly essential to understand how we can make online safety resources more accessible for parents uh, and in a way that's aligned with their and their children's needs and experiences. So one uh, parent participant, as we saw in the video in the previous session, mentioned the importance of online content that is customizable. And I think this is a very important point because every child experiences the digital world in a different way. And I think in this context, it's essential that we incorporate the voices of parents and, and youth in the design of online safety information, especially those from underrepresented communities, whether in terms of, for instance, ethnicity, race, gender and sexual identity, skill, an educational level or socioeconomic status. Okay, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Got a couple more questions. They're coming in. You see, look what we got started. Um, so I have another question from Salome, uh, media and communications researcher, and I'm just going to leave this open. So whoever between Molly, Ethan, or Alexa wants to answer it, you guys jump right in. Um, she's asking in general to the panel, what are your thoughts on the parental mediation model applying to current challenges? Do they see the need for refining this model, refining the parental, parental mediation model? Any takers? Oh, Alexa's nodding her head. Go for it, Alexa. So in terms of, for instance, screen time, I think parenting arrangements are very much part of this equation, uh, particularly now uh, during COVID. For example, with a single parent working two jobs right now, enforcing any types of limits may be more difficult than in homes with multiple caregivers and more flexible work hours. And as John Palfrey and Urs Gasser note in their recently released book, The Connected Parent, as with many things in life and in parenting, it's very much about finding a healthy balance and staying consistent with the plans that you do put in place. And so for parents, it might be helpful to think through a series of questions as they think about their plans for online time. For example, are your children doing well in school? Do they seem to have a healthy and positive social life? Uh, when they're interacting with media, is it usually a positive experiences? And are they getting enough sleep and eating in a healthy way? And I think if any of the answers to those questions seem off to parents, it might be helpful to review the uh, child's screen habits. And, and when you set a plan in place to stick to it, uh, consistency is, is really essential. And, and finally, I think it's also important to remember that the quality of screen time matters more than just the sheer quantity. Of, yes, of time. yes. And, and I would say, Molly, I'm going to come over to you in a second. Uh, just for me, I loved hearing your, your resume about what parents should be looking at, uh, because I remember uh, being in London at the London School of Economics with Sonia Livingston and Alicia Bloom Ross as they were devising this family screen policy. And those were the five checklist points uh, that, that came out of this, this huge uh, expert meeting. So it's just so fabulous to see uh, that the, world, the word is spreading. And I know I'm doing my part to make sure parents know, because really, having those conversations and asking those questions is just just enormous in some of the things that parents can do. Molly, go ahead. What were you going Great. to say? No, 
I, I want to say that I agree with everything that Alexa is saying. I think it's an excellent question too. And the, the, in the research that, that we do sort of uh, on a practically weekly basis with parents and kids, so in sort of the, the practical application of, of screen time in particular, uh, parents, I believe, have the best intentions at heart. And I, and I do feel that the parents I talk to are going through a lot of the checklist that Alexa just mentioned, like, how can I fit this all into the balance? And also, uh, you know, Alexa, your first nod you gave to like, okay, well, the family circumstance makes a difference too. We also see, and it's interesting, that uh, not only digital babysitter um, is sometimes necessary for, for parents of, in any situation, but also this idea of um, a negotiation. Screen time can also become a tool for parents for better or worse of like, okay, this is the rule. This is the established rule now. Have you accomplished all of these things on your list? Have you done all of these things? Are you being a nice person, positive member of this family? <laughs> you can be rewarded with an extra 30 minutes. Um, uh, and maybe, or maybe that's just me. No, we, we talked to a lot of parents who use it as a, as a tool. And uh, in, in that way, they're still maintaining their control over the screen time situation, but it, be, it can become a, a reward, um, which then can help reinforce some yeah, of the Molly, positive behavior. I think you've been looking at my house too, because that's, that's how I do it. <laughs> I think um, we're mirroring. <laughs> I think so. But I also think that Ethan, uh, when he mentioned uh, a deal, you know, this is a great time to make a deal. That kind of made me giggle because, uh, you know, I, I call them family media agreements, but you're right. Ethan, it's all about making a deal, right? About, you know, finding that balance. Um, you also unmuted yourself, Ethan. Did you want to add to that question? I just wanted to add, I, th I think I Molly kind of described my house exactly <laughs> right, which is this, this constant negotiation about screen time. And I think during the pandemic, when parents are just so stressed out and there's so much going on, I think parental controls really have a huge role to play in being that mediator, in, in jumping in and you know, turning off that screen at the end of 30 minutes or an hour. That is you know, typically something a parent can do, but this is not really a great time for parents to be trying to look over their kid's shoulder while also working from home and doing everything else they need to do to keep the household running. So I think the pandemic is maybe the best possible time for parents to explore the power of these parental controls. And it's something that we at Verizon have been trying to get the message out about that, look, this is a very strange time. This is not a time that parents have a lot of free time to be able to do the kind of oversight that parents typically would want to be able to do. And parental controls, while they're not perfect and they are not a substitute for a parent in the room, they can be a backup and they can be that, that forcing function that blocks that screen after an hour. Whereas I will say one more hour and then an hour and a half later, I'm like, oh, I forgot, what are my kids? <laughs> that happens all the time. So Ethan, it, Ethan, don't, don't, don't tell them all that. <laughs> We're all perfect, perfect digital parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's good that they can see the reality. We all are in this, which is why it, I think it's fabulous that we're all, you know, looking for solutions and, and sharing, you know, resources like this, which is just fabulous. Ethan, thank you for talking about the pandemic because you did lead me to another question that we actually received, which was how much do you think that, um, the, that COVID-19 and the pandemic will affect families' relationships? with parental controls and tools, not the relationships themselves, because we already know that the, that's hugely changed, but um, the relationships of how they view parental controls and the tools. I know the so, industry would like people to say, hey, this is great, but how do you think the families are gonna look at it? So my hope is that this is a net positive for families that I think as terrible as this time is in a lot of ways, I do think there are a lot of benefits. We've never had more family time than we've had during the pandemic, certainly. True. And I think parents are getting a, a very close view about how their kids spend their screen time and probably learning quite a bit about the games that their kids are playing and who they're interacting with. I certainly have. <laughs> so I think that this is in a lot of ways a great time and a great experiment in, in educating parents about what their kids are up to but also kind of giving parents that opportunity to explore the options that are available to them in parental controls and right. seeing the benefits of a lot of these tools that will help them even when the pandemic is long since over, hopefully, where they can have learned during this very tough period and they can apply those lessons going forward. Okay, well, I think you just nailed it because as you're talking about parents, how many of us are playing among us with our children? Uh, see, I knew, yeah, there we go. Uh-huh, I knew it, 
I knew it. I could tell. I could tell. Um, <laughs> so with that positive note, I'm going to go back over to a couple more questions. Um, this one is for the small number of parents uh, who report not having any conversations about online safety uh, with their kids or those that don't use parental controls. Um, Alexa, Molly, what are the obstacles that may be causing a disconnect? What, what do you think? This was an open question, but I'm just targeting. I'll start if it's okay, Alex. I'd love to yes. hear what you have to build on it. Um, in the in the study specifically, the parents who were that we conducted, um, parents who had not uh, implemented controls <clears throat> or didn't currently have controls implemented at the time of the study, um, it spoke to that overwhelm. Like, I don't know where to start. I'm not sure what to do. Is this going to be enough? Uh, is it going to really solve what I want without creating another problem? There's some just general anxiety about any kind of setting. It's like the people who are afraid to hit the back button because they don't know if they're going to, if it's going to take them where they need to go or like click on the link. It's it's uh, a little bit of frozen anxiety. Uh, the parental conversation piece, um, we, I, we did see it more in parents of younger kids. Uh, it was more prevalent that, which, which does make sense. A two to six year old um, might be a little less uh, willing or, or able to sort of comprehend what a parent might think they need to tell them. Parents are more often to just sort of set a, you know, a, an age limit on Netflix and let it go um, at that. There also just are some parents who just are not, that you, some families communicate better than others. And some okay. parents are just, not going to sit down and have that conversation without uh, an incident to respond to. Okay, I'm going to hold you there because we only have a few more minutes left. Sorry. Alexa, go ahead. <laughs> I, I very much agree with, with Molly's points. And I think also part of it is, as I touched upon earlier, the notion of customization uh, and that these, um, this information really needs to be um, customized to the needs and experiences of youth and the individuals and, and communities who care for them. So for instance, a guiding principle of, of our youth and media team is to incorporate the voices of youth from many different communities in our educational content. We have, as one example, an educational resource repository, the Digital Citizenship Plus resource platform that's home to over 100 open access educational tools co-designed with youth themselves that can be used to learn and teach about the digital world. And a number of these tools can be done by youth on their own at home, uh, but we very much encourage parents to engage in these activities with their children. And we're also thinking about how to design fun and educational activities that families can, can engage in together. That's perfect, Alexa, because that brought me to my last question, with, and I'm really going to try to go quickly. Ethan, it's for you. This is from Cindy Comrack, who's a, a K-12 educator, and so Alexa was just talking about educational materials, and it's what training can industry provide parents to support and prepare them to manage at-home education? You got 10 seconds. Wow. So that's a big question. <laughs> and I don't know if I can answer it in 10 seconds. I think industry has a role to play here, but I don't think industry alone can solve this problem. Okay. At home education is tremendously complex. And I think we need teachers, we need schools, we need governments. It's got to be more than just industry to solve that one. Perfect. I'll take it. And so with our last few minutes left, I would like each of you guys to give a, a takeaway or a um, just something that you would love for parents to know. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you, Molly, um, what do parents and teens think is missing from the online safety narrative? Do you have anything quick? Sure, so back to Alexa's earlier point about what do those conversations look like? I think it was the first conversation, the first uh, point that Alexa was making though, when parents and teens are having these conversations, I think the more parents can get in front of issues before they happen. So they're having a positive, calm, rational conversation about expectations and, and scenarios and running through hypotheticals and explaining, putting it, teens can understand like, oh yeah, wait, if I did that and then that happened, that would be terrible. I don't want that to happen. Uh, rather than sort of that reactionary conversation that can end up being punitive and making everybody feel bad about what okay. happens. So I think that we can get in front of it. Got it. And Alexa, for you, what topics, type of research do you think is more needed? I think moving forward, it's, it's particularly important to think about how we can effectively involve the voices of youth and parents and families 
in the dialogue around how to keep children safe online to ensure that the tools and educational initiatives are even more aligned with parents and children's needs, experiences, and, and backgrounds. Absolutely perfect. And Ethan, I'm going to go to you with my last question, even though I think I'm right at time, which is how will Verizon use the results um, to enhance resources for families? I think that's really important. Uh, it's on you. Industry, let's go. So I think we've learned a lot. I think one thing I really want to focus on is this idea of the one-stop shop. I think we heard loud and clear from parents, and it's understandable that it's really hard to have to search for 15 different devices and figure out 15 different parental controls. That's not an easy thing for us to do as industry. We need to get together and figure out how we can create a, a resource that spans a lot of different products. But I think it's really important. And I think right now we are asking too much of parents to have to search across the entire internet to figure all of this out. Oh, that is perfect. That's a great conclusion. So I'm going to say thank you so much to this fabulous panel. Audience, get out there, put hashtag FOSI 2020, best panel ever, we rock, parents rock, okay? <laughs> you guys keep your digital family safe. And they probably won't let me come back, but that's okay. You guys enjoy. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Bye-bye. Thank you all. And I would add my thank you. Elizabeth, you're always welcome. So please, please uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and thank you all, that great panel for such a wonderful discussion. Um, there's much for us to work on. And to Ethan's last point, it's something certainly we're gonna continue discussing within FOSI about how best to follow up on some of the findings in the report. Um, a number of you have asked in the chat, yes, the research report, the PowerPoint slides, the executive summary, and even a press release are all up now on the FOSI website. Uh, so go to FOSI.org and click on the button that says for professionals, and then you'll see them all there. Uh, and also another yes, videos from today's sessions will be put up on FOSI's YouTube channel in the coming days. 